Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Wingstop, Inc. Fiscal First Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. Please note that this conference is being recorded today, Wednesday, May 6, 2020. On the call, we have Charlie Morrison, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Michael Skipworth, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I would now like to turn the conference over to Michael. Please go ahead. Thank you and welcome. Everyone should have access to our fiscal first quarter 2020 earnings release. A copy is posted under the Investor Relations tab on our website at ir.wingstop.com. Our discussion today includes forward-looking statements. These statements are not guarantees of future performance and are subject to numerous risk and uncertainties that could cause our actual results to differ materially from what we currently expect. Our SEC filings describe various risks that could affect our future operating results and financial condition. We use certain non-GAAP financial measures that we believe can be useful in evaluating our performance. Presentation of such information should not be considered in isolation or as a substitute for results prepared in accordance with GAAP. Reconciliations to comparable GAAP measures are contained in our earnings release. Today, we will be discussing preliminary sales results for the first four weeks of the second fiscal quarter. We have not completed closing procedures for the second quarter, and our independent registered public accounting firm has not reviewed our results. Accordingly, all preliminary results discussed today are subject to change pending finalization, and actual results could differ materially. Lastly, for the Q&A session, we ask that you please each keep to one question and a follow-up to allow as many participants as possible to ask a question. With that, I would like to turn the call over to Charlie. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us for our call this morning and hope everyone is safe and well. These are certainly unprecedented times, especially for Wingstop and those in the restaurant business. Before I comment on recent trends and how Wingstop is navigating the ever-changing COVID-19 crisis, I would like to thank the thousands of team members working in Wingstop restaurants around the world for their continued commitment to our mission to serve the world flavor. These amazing people have been on the front line providing safe access for our guests to continue to enjoy the bold and craveable flavors of our fresh, cooked-to-order wings, fries, and sides. I'd also like to thank our franchisees, whom we affectionately refer to as our brand partners, who have done an exceptional job navigating this challenging situation by adhering to the strict standards we have implemented to ensure the safety of our guests and our team members. On April 7th, I issued an open letter outlining how Wingstop is navigating its journey through the COVID-19 crisis. And this morning, we are providing an update that includes recent trends for the first four weeks of the second quarter, which Michael will share in more detail later. While we're still early into our second quarter, recent trends in sales highlight the resiliency of the Wingstop brand and the continued hard work of our team members, brand partners, and supplier partners to address the demand we have seen from our guests. We remain truly humbled by the results and will continue our efforts that are intended to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19. I mentioned in my open letter that we truly believe our success has been the result of anchoring our response to the pandemic in our core values, which include maintaining our authenticity, remaining steadfast in our service-minded attitude, and respecting our entrepreneurial roots. We refer to our value system as the Wingstop way. I believe at any time, but especially in times like these, our shared behaved values are the best indicator of the past, present, and future success of any company. For Wingstop, authenticity not only speaks to our high quality cook to order food, but includes our aspiration to be transparent and genuine in every decision we make. We formed a COVID-19 task force that met every day and included team members from all parts of the organization. As information becomes available in this ever-changing climate, it has been rapidly assessed and disseminated to our team members, brand partners, and guests in an authentic and transparent manner 
while recognizing those things we can and cannot control. To be service-minded means that the needs and safety of all our stakeholders are at the forefront. We have placed a sense of urgency to ensure that we acted quickly in every implementation, cascading our communications frequently and with necessary repetition so that clarity was achieved by all involved. Our brand partners have expressed to us their pleasure with the increased frequency and clarity of our communications that helped them act quickly at the restaurant level to implement changes responsive to the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, our business has been built on the backs of entrepreneurs, including our founder and our brand partners. Our roots remain strong to the original format of our great brand. Our focus on simplicity, scratch recipes, and a takeout orientation have served us well in this difficult time. Entrepreneurs make decisions quickly by relying on clarity over certainty. At Wingstop, we embraced our entrepreneurial spirit to pivot quickly to modify our operations and service approach, redirect our advertising, and implement rapid changes to our technology that ensure our guests' experience meets the needs of this extraordinary time. Leveraging our core values, our response to the crisis focused on three key priorities, which include supporting the well-being and safety of our team members, brand partners, and guests, continuing to serve our Wingstop fans' flavor in a safe and clean environment, and giving back to our communities where we operate. These remain the foundation of our operations for our 1,400-plus global restaurants each day as we navigate through this crisis. As I mentioned, we made the decision to close our domestic dining rooms and offer carryout and delivery only on March 16, 2020, which represented approximately 80% of our domestic sales prior to that time. As we shared in our business update on April 7th, we saw a slight acceleration in our domestic same-store sales during the last two weeks of the first quarter. The first four weeks of the second quarter were even stronger. Prior to the outbreak of COVID-19, digital sales consisted of just over 40% of our sales. Since closing our dining rooms, Digital and delivery orders now account for more than 65% of our sales. We believe that the strategic investments that followed our strategy to build a world-class digital platform, plus the rollout of national delivery in 2019, provided a strong foundation for us and have led to the success we have seen during this time. To quantify the impact, our domestic same-store sales growth exceeded 30% for the first four weeks of the second quarter, which is well beyond even our own expectations. Our brand partners, supplier partners, led by our friends at Performance Food Group and our delivery partner, DoorDash, have not missed a beat with this substantial change in volume. We are humbled by our performance and remain confident in the solid positioning of our brand in life during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Our international business, however, has been adversely affected by COVID-19. As of the end of the first quarter, our international footprint consisted of 160 restaurants in nine countries outside the U.S. Our model has relied more heavily on dining rooms for locations in larger malls or, in Mexico, casual dining, sports bars. Despite the adversity, our international team and brand partners have reacted well by leveraging our domestic experience and our core values to swiftly provide access to takeout and delivery in markets where restaurants are allowed to remain open. We have also worked closely with our international brand partners by providing financial support to help mitigate the impact of lower sales levels so they can reemerge stronger and well positioned for continued unit growth. This pandemic has further validated our international growth strategy we unveiled in January which prioritizes future growth in markets that can support higher off-premise sales, a premium price positioning, and leverages our efficient operating model to deliver a high-quality flavor experience similar to our domestic operations. Our strong domestic top-line performance comes at a time when prices for bone-in wings have been at record lows, falling below $1 per pound for a short period. Over the past week, however, with shortages in meat supply across the country, we have seen prices begin to rise, but still well below levels pre-COVID-19. 
Thus, our domestic brand partners are seeing strong four-wall performance in their restaurant. With this good fortune and anchored in our commitment to corporate responsibility, we launched a Flavor for Good week beginning April 19th and lasting through April 25th. During this time, we engaged our brand partners as well as the support of Wingstop Charities to identify ways to give back and serve the world flavor to teachers, healthcare workers, and first responders in our communities who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Our generous brand partners along with Wingstop Charities provided more than one million meals to those impacted by the pandemic through cash and food donations. In addition to our community outreach, we supported our brethren in the restaurant industry by joining forces with the National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation and Guy Fieri to support the Restaurant Employee Relief Fund. Wingstop donated $1 million to the Restaurant Employee Relief Fund to provide access to $500 grants per person for restaurant workers who will desperately need aid in the coming weeks and months as our industry gets back on its feet. I'm truly humbled by the generosity of our team and our brand partners. While we are humbled by our results at the beginning of the second quarter, there remains uncertainty about shelter-in-place orders, reopening timing for businesses, school reopenings, and so many other factors. Thus, we do not have clarity around the ongoing magnitude of the impact of this pandemic on our performance or the restaurant industry. Because of the lack of clarity, we are withdrawing our 2020 guidance. We believe our recent performance validates the strength of our brand. However, trying to predict the outcome of this unprecedented year would not be prudent. We will maintain our typical level of transparency as a means to provide clarity as to how our business is performing and provide timely updates to our trends when we feel it is necessary. I would like to close by again thanking our team members, brand partners, supplier partners, and guests for their continued support of Wingstop. I would also like to thank our shareholders, many of whom have been with us for our five years as a public company, for your support and confidence during this time. At Wingstop, we recognize the responsibility we have to all the various stakeholders we serve, including our team members, brand partners, supplier partners, shareholders, and the communities in which we operate. We appreciate how all of these stakeholders have come together in a supportive way to enable us to continue our mission to serve the world flavor and achieve our vision of becoming a top 10 global restaurant brand. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Charlie. Today I will provide brief highlights on our first quarter results, but focus most of my comments on our performance for the first four weeks of the second quarter of 2020. In the first quarter, we opened 28 net new restaurants, resulting in 1,413 system-wide restaurants. Royalties, franchise fees, and other revenue increased by $2.9 million to $24.2 million for the first quarter. Driven primarily by our domestic same-store sales growth of 9.9% and 137 net franchise openings since the year-ago comparable period. Company-owned restaurant sales increased $1.7 million to $15.2 million for the first quarter. This increase is due primarily to same-store sales growth of 6.2%, the acquisition of one franchise restaurant since the second quarter of 2019, and the opening of two company-owned restaurants in the Kansas City market. These revenue increases translated to adjusted EBITDA, a non-GAAP measure, of $16.4 million, representing an increase of 17.8% over the same period in the prior fiscal year. There is a reconciliation table between adjusted EBITDA and net income, its most directly comparable GAAP measure, included in our earnings release. Net income in the first quarter was $8.1 million, or $0.27 cents per diluted share, up from, from $0.22 cents in the prior year first quarter. Please refer to today's press release for additional details on the first quarter. With that, I would like to provide more detail on our performance and preliminary domestic same-store sales growth for the first four weeks of the second quarter. As a reminder, we experienced a slight uptick in domestic same-store sales in the last two weeks of the first quarter. And as you heard from Charlie, the first four weeks of April have been even stronger. 
Domestic same-store sales increased 33.4% in the first four weeks of the second quarter, far exceeding our own expectations. Company-owned restaurant same-store sales increased 32.6% during the same time period. When we closed our dining rooms in mid-March, we initially experienced a decline in transactions. While we did not initially replace all of those transactions with off-premise orders, we did see a higher average check as most of our dine-in sales have a smaller average check and support individual guests more than group occasions. As April progressed, we experienced an acceleration in our same-store sales growth. This acceleration was due primarily to average check growth resulting from a higher mix of digital and delivery channels, which typically have a $5 higher average check than our traditional channels. When compared to dine-in transactions, digital transactions can be as much as $10 higher. The strategic investments we have made to establish a world-class digital platform, along with the rollout of national delivery in 2019, provided a strong foundation for our brand during this time and has led to the success we have seen. We entered 2020 with a national TV advertising campaign focused on highlighting our unique flavor experience and showcasing delivery as a new way to experience the brand through Wingstop.com and our Wingstop app. This was the first time we leveraged national advertising to promote delivery as a channel. As we navigated the initial days of this crisis, we quickly pivoted and partnered with DoorDash to offer free delivery via Wingstop.com and our Wingstop app to ease the burden of delivery fees for guests. The promotion continued through April 30th. We ended the first quarter with 47% of our sales through digital channels. We saw this accelerate to over 65% of sales during April. We believe that the message of delivery will play a key role as we continue to execute against our goal of digitizing every transaction as 100% of delivery orders are digital. In addition to the message of delivery, we also quickly pivoted and repositioned advertising that was initially planned for live sports to areas such as video streaming and gaming platforms, social and paid search, and other areas where we believe guests would be consuming content while sheltering at home. While we enjoyed strong same-store sales growth in our domestic business, we did have a small number of restaurants that temporarily closed as a result of the closing of casinos, malls, and college campuses due to local and state guidelines. Outside of the U.S., there are currently 26 restaurants temporarily closed. However, across our entire global system, temporary closures represent less than 3% of all system restaurants. In addition to the strong top-line performance, we also experienced the good fortune of strong retail demand for chicken breast meat, which created an excess supply of jumbo chicken wings, resulting in deflation of wing prices. This provides an immediate P&L and cash benefit to our brand partners as we purchase wings off the spot market weekly. We are making investments both at the restaurant level in our team members and our communities during this time of crisis, including frontline incentive pay and enhanced sick leave policies for our team members, investments in critical supplies to protect our team and guests, such as thermometers, face coverings, and gloves, and charitable contributions and outreach. Our team member incentive pay for full-time and part-time workers, where team members can earn up to an extra $150 a week, started in March and was initially planned to end in April, but has been extended through the end of May to continue to support our restaurant team members on the front lines. I also want to highlight for modeling purposes the $1 million contribution to the National Restaurant Association's Restaurant Employee Relief Fund that Charlie referenced earlier will hit SG&A in the second quarter. As Charlie mentioned, the majority of our international restaurants rely more heavily on dining rooms and have been adversely impacted by this pandemic. Most international restaurants are experiencing sales declines in the 50% range due to the dining room closures. With the uncertainty surrounding the developments of COVID-19, and as a precautionary measure, in mid-March, we borrowed $16 million under our outstanding variable funding notes to enhance our cash position. 
providing us with an unrestricted cash balance of approximately $31 million at the end of the first fiscal quarter. We have not had a need to access that capital, but out of an abundance of caution, we do not currently intend to repay the variable funding notes. We remain committed to returning capital to shareholders through our quarterly dividend, which is targeted at 40% of free cash flow. Our board of directors has declared a dividend of 11 cents per share of common stock. This dividend, totaling approximately $3.2 million, will be paid on June 25th to stockholders of record as of June 18th. We are consistently evaluating the best use of excess capital, and we feel our quarterly dividend is an important part of our commitment to our shareholders. I would also like to comment on two transactions expected to close in the second quarter that you will see disclosed in our 10Q. Subsequent to the end of the first quarter, we entered into two separate arrangements to refranchise two company-owned restaurants in the Houston market and five company-owned restaurants in the Kansas City market for aggregate proceeds of approximately $4.8 million. At closing, the Kansas City transaction will include a development agreement for an additional 20 restaurants in that market. We are encouraged by the resiliency of the Wingstop business model as we have navigated this crisis and are humbled by our overall results. This, combined with our strategy, continue to support our confidence in our long-term growth and our vision of becoming a top 10 global restaurant brand. With that, I would like to turn the call over for Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, may press star then one on your touchstone phone. If you're using a speaker phone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. The first question today comes from David Tarantino with Baird. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh hope you you both are doing well and uh and congratulations on, on the results you're delivering. Uh truly impressive. Um my question, Charlie, is really on the sales strength you you've seen in April. And I, I'm wondering if you could give your thoughts on um the sustainability of of some of the sales gains you've had. Um it seems like they're are a lot of cross currents. There's, you know, government stimulus potentially helping. Uh, so just wondering if there's anything inside your data that could help uh, us understand um, how much of the sales gain you might be able to hold on to uh, as you exit this period. Thanks. Uh, good morning, David. Uh, certainly hope this finds you well as well. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, we. Uh, we were certainly encouraged uh, by the pace at which our same store sales grew in the month of April. Uh, and I think largely that was driven uh, by a couple of factors. Number one, growth related to delivery. Uh, as we had mentioned before and in the script, we introduced free delivery during uh, the month of April um, and the late part of uh, March as well and saw a great take rate from our uh, guests, both new and existing guests, on the delivery. And uh, as we've mentioned before, that delivery check is substantially higher than a traditional dine-in occasion that we see. Uh, in fact, it, a delivery against dine-in alone can be as much as $10 higher. Uh, that has ab absolutely fueled uh, check growth for the brand um, while also achieving transaction growth through the offer of free delivery. We exited that uh, promotion at the end of April, uh, but we're still encouraged by all of the different drivers uh, that can continue to uh, help Wingstop grow into the future. Uh, certainly, things like the stimulus money uh, have probably had a factor in this, as it has uh, for others um, in, in our space. Uh, but really, we think that our preparation for the migration to uh, a heavy digital format, um, even losing the dine-in business, which only represented about 20% of our sales, uh, is a key indicator for what we think the future holds for the brand. Thanks for that. And, and one quick follow-up on, 
on the surge you've seen, I guess, in delivery sales, um, is there any way for you to to determine, you know, whether those are new customers to the brand um, that are that are perhaps being introduced in the system for the first time, or anything in your data that that would be helpful to understand what what type of um, consumer dynamic is going on underneath the surface? Sure. Um, to remind you, prior to the rollout of delivery advertising this year, we experienced about an 80% to 20% mix of marketplace orders to our what we call uh, wingstop.com or dispatch orders, we call them internally. Um, that, sh that mix has shifted rather nicely to about 50-50 during the month of April, driven by the fact that we did this promotion on wingstop.com orders only. And when we do that, we gain all of the insights of who the consumers are that are choosing delivery. We have found that a large number of these uh, are new guests to our business, um, but also existing uh, customers as well. And so that rich information we gain from that 50-50 uh, split between the marketplace and the wingstop.com orders encourages us that we are bringing new guests into the business. Great. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Catherine Fogarty with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Hope everybody uh, is doing well. Um, what, my question is around uh, the franchisee system here. Um, and you alluded to you know, the wing price deflation being um, helpful for their um, economics, but can you kind of help us quantify the benefit that they're seeing here, you know, both from that and then um, you know, are they eligible here to get uh, PPP under the CARES program? Um, and if you could also, you know, talk about how that then, you know, uh, squares away for the pipeline for unit growth, um, you know, just remind us what the average profile is of your franchisee um, and if there's any caps on, on how big a franchisee can get. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Katie. Hope you're well as, as well. Um, let me uh, answer those in order. So the, uh, the strength of the unit economics for our brand partners is, is great right now. Um, they're experiencing strong top line growth as well as substantially improved economics through food cost um, driven by those lower wing prices. And as we noted uh, in the call, uh, those were somewhat temporary, but they're still well below where we were pre-COVID. To give perspective, pre-COVID wing prices were hovering in the $1.60 a pound range. They fell as far as $0.97 cents a pound, and I think today have risen back with some of the um, tight meat supply back into the mid-dollar 20s. So uh, they're experiencing, you know, they can experience anywhere from, uh, you know, three to six uh, points of improvement in food costs during that time frame, which is meaningful. Some franchisees have uh, reinvested that money into uh, their payroll line to help uh, provide incentives for their team members uh, to retain their staff and, uh, and, and thank them for their hard work and commitment during this difficult time. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, fluctuation in the P&L in that regard, and you'll see that in the company store performance as well. But overall, uh, it does point to strong cash flow, uh, which then, you know, the question is, what do they do with that? And uh, once the market uh, starts to open back up, and specifically what we mean by that is the ability to build restaurants, to obtain permits, to obtain the, uh, all, the, all the licenses and everything we need to operate, uh, we do expect to see our franchisees get right back into the swing of things on delivery. Um, there's going to be a temporary s slowdown in that, as we've noted, uh, simply because of things we cannot control. But on the back side of this, looking out longer term, Certainly, it, um, all of this points to the strength uh, of the of the Wingstop brand, its resiliency, uh, and its ability to continue to grow even during the most difficult times. Um, to your question on the PPP loans, uh, like anyone else, yes, I believe our franchisees are eligible as any small business would have been uh, during this time frame. So uh, certainly, there's eligibility. 
Great, thanks. And I just want to follow up. Um, you know, if the free delivery promotions were working so well, um, what what is the thought behind uh, stopping those here? Well, I think we wanted to better understand how much of a stimulus this was for the business. Um, it does come with a cost um, because those fees have to be uh, borne by our franchisees and or the company. And so uh, we wanted to, while, while we love the promotion, um, taking in all of those fees and paying for those on behalf of the guest is, can be rather expensive. So we liked what we saw during this process. We want to see what uh, the business can sustain from there and then use that as an opportunistic uh, promotion down the road as needed. Great, thank you. The next question comes from Jeffrey Bernstein with Barclays. Please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Um, two questions. One, just on the heels of COVID, um, scary enough, but it seems like recession is on the come. Um, it would seem like most of your peers, not to say would welcome that, but uh, their comps likely wouldn't fall as much or to the same magnitude as the impact from COVID. Whereas in your case, it does seem like the comps are currently tremendous. Um, but I would think you would be more vulnerable targeting a lower income customer, especially if we were to see like 20% unemployment, which people are talking about. So can you just talk about um, the transition from the COVID headwinds we see today to a potential recession going forward, maybe any past experiences you've seen in a slowdown or any concerns you have around that lower income vulnerability? And then I had one follow-up. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't believe this brand um, has any more or less risk necessarily uh, associated with the potential of a recession. Uh, if you look back at our experience um, during 08, 09, the brand grew through that time frame as well. And I think uh, the differentiator for Wingstop is that we do exist in a category all by ourselves. We don't have a direct competitor. We tend not to have to fight a price war if one exists in, a, in an environment like that. And our customers clearly tell us, and we've researched this even during this time frame, the reason they come to Wingstop is because of that crave, because of that unique product positioning that nobody else has, and so it becomes uh, a real advantage uh, for us. So um, we're, we're pretty confident we can grow through this, and I think our current performance, even if it were to subside slightly, um, would still be um, fantastic um, for, for our franchisees. Absolutely. And then just to follow up on an earlier question regarding franchisee development, presumably when development is permitted once again, um, I mean, your results remind me of another chicken chain with very strong results, and for you, that's without actually a new product launch, so all the more impressive. Um, so I'm just wondering the thoughts on the franchise demand for new unit growth. I know you guys talk about 10% plus annually, but is that something that you look to kind of cage at that 10% level or if the greater high-quality demand is there, that's not something that you would cap at 10%. What would keep you from allowing that growth to accelerate from here? Thanks. Yeah, it, it, a fantastic question. I, the feedback we're hearing from our brand partners uh, is very bullish and confident, um, excited to get back in and develop restaurants. Um, certainly, as I mentioned before and you mentioned as well, we have to wait for uh, quote unquote, the markets to open uh, to be able to get that done. Um, but there are a few ways we can we can capitalize on that. One is uh, we can assist our franchisees if needed to help accelerate the pace of development um, with our strong position and our and, and potentially our cash similar to what we've done in the Kansas City market as an example, which Michael commented on. Uh, that gives us an opportunity to look at select markets as opportunities to ac accelerate growth and refranchise if we choose to do so. So I think we're, we're evaluating all the possible opportunities, but it goes without saying that um, this appears to be, for Wingstop, um, a great opportunity to accelerate the pace of growth. Thank you very much. The next question comes from John Glass with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Good to hear everyone's voices. Charlie, can you just help maybe just understand a little bit more on 
what the components of the comp growth in April were from a check and traffic standpoint. I know you don't, haven't broken that out specifically, but these are unusual dynamics and unusual times. So you can just help maybe just unpack, and you gave us some pieces around that, but is it largely check growth, and this is just family meal replacement, or any way to better understand the under, underneath the 30%? Hi, John. Good morning. Uh, great to hear your voice as well. Um, let me let me paint this picture as best I can without we, – we don't cite specifics, as you know, um, but I'll give you some context to it. Certainly, the uh, majority of our growth uh, in the comp is associated with check lift. But to give some added perspective, we shut down our dining rooms, lost all of our dine-in business, uh, and that represents about 20% of our sales. On a one-to-one -one almost trade-off, we replace that with carry-out business. And so if you look at delivery, delivery is really the big growth driver for the brand, and it comes at a very nice high check average. And that can be as much as $10, as I mentioned before, $10 higher than a dine-in occasion, a pure dine-in occasion, not the average occasion for the brand, but that dine-in occasion. So that that is fueling two things. One, new customers coming to the business by way of transaction growth, but at a much higher check than we normally see. So again, just to rephrase, carry out growth, replace the dine-in loss, delivery is the big driver, delivery comes with a very high check. That's how to reconcile the growth. That's, that's helpful, thank you. And then just you talked about new users coming to the brand. Do you, do you have numbers around what percentage of transactions, to the extent you know, are, are in fact new users to the brand and how, how you intend to retain those customers? I presume that's a very, this is a very valuable time because customer acquisition costs has dropped, presumably, fairly dramatically. Yeah, um, an excellent question. It's too early right now, John, to give any numbers to that, um, but directional indication is that there are definitely new users coming into the business. Hopefully we can uh, quantify that a little bit better when we get into our next readout. Um, just a little early with only one month under our belt to really quantify that. Thank you. The next question comes from Andy Barish with Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hey guys, anything um, different on the menu with, you know, um, promotionally um, during this period other than the free delivery, um, you know, assuming you skewed more family meals, but was there any any um, additions to the menu from that side? And then just your thoughts on, you know, as, re as additional restaurants kind of reopen, um, what you guys are thinking with, with your own dining areas or um, maybe more importantly, just how other restaurant options become available? What do you think that that looks like going forward for, um, you know, for your off-premise sales uh, pace. Good morning, Andy. Um, first of all, uh, as it relates to the product uh, question, we really have done nothing different product-wise during this time frame, other than we've seen uh, definitely a mix shift from individual occasions where they might get an eight-piece or a ten-piece wing combo to much more of a family uh, pack, which might have a mix of bone-in and boneless wings or our tenders um, and, you know, the various flavors to provide to the family. Our internal research suggests that that really is a key driver for people to choose Wingstop. There's no negotiation over a pizza. It's not a drive-through, but yet it gives everybody flexibility to order, and I think that's always been um, you know, a, a real strong point for the positioning of our menu and the brand, um, but no, no other changes there. Um, as it relates to, you know, the, the reentry of uh, dining room uh, oriented brands or casual dining and the, and the rest, I really don't know that it's going to have uh, a big impact. It certainly could take away some occasions just based on the fact that there were only a few convenient options and it was, may have been more difficult to go to those concepts. Um, but going back to that research we have, I, I really feel strong that our consumers come to our brand because of our products and because of the ease and simplicity of ordering. And most of the research would suggest that people are going to be still quite tentative 
to get back out into dining rooms. Uh, that's a good reason why we are going to hold back as long as we need to, um, probably longer than most, to reopening our dining rooms because we feel like the occasion that we're providing is the safest uh, uh, compared to a dine-in occasion. And I think consumers support that. Thanks, guys. Be well. You too, Andy. Thank you. The next question comes from Andrew Charles with Cohen and Company. Please go ahead. Great, and glad to hear that you guys are staying safe. Um, you mentioned supply chain hasn't missed a beat, and I, I just think just given what's going on with some parts of the protein market, if we could just dive in and just talk about the assurances that you have in place for your vendors, that the supply of bone and wings, which are obviously never frozen and thus can't be stocked out as much as if they were, um, as well as white meat for boneless will be secured. And, and just curious as well, and I know you're not giving guidance, but to the degree you can share, what are you, what are you hearing from vendors on their outlook for the uh, for inflation uh, in chicken? Thanks. Uh, good morning, Andrew. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned uh, they didn't miss a beat, and I have to certainly continue to pay a compliment to all of our supplier partners, uh, as well as Performance Food Group. Um, you know, all of them have been hit pretty hard by the, the shutdown, and all of them have been fantastic in their support of Wingstop as we've been growing. Um, you know, we, were, we have been bringing in more chicken than, you know, we've, we've ever brought before, uh, and they really haven't missed a beat. Um, as it relates to the strength of our supply chain, uh, we have a very diversified uh, approach to our supply. Um, while we have maybe nine different companies that supply chicken, that chicken comes from almost 20 different places. Um, so, you know, the risk of any sort of impact uh, to a particular plant is mitigated by the availability of supply in other areas. So we've, we've built this uh, chain to be diverse. And uh, while we don't prefer to have frozen wings in our system, we do have the ability to get those if we need to and stockpile those. So I just want to clarify that point. It is a product that we can do that with if needed. It's not our preference, but it is possible. Um, and then, uh, you know, the indication from our suppliers is, is really centered around making sure that they have availability of supply, which we're comfortable with. Um, as it relates to the prognostic prognosticators and what they think about the market, hard to tell. Um, it'll all have to do with uh, the supply of chicken against the competing meats of uh, beef and pork. Um, chicken supplies appear to be reemerging after a, uh, after a pullback. Um, beef and pork uh, still seem to be uh, dropping, so chicken is always a substitute for that. Um, but we're confident we're going to have uh, supply into our restaurants as needed during this, uh, this challenge. That's helpful. Thank you. The next question comes from Jeff Farmer with Gordon Haskett. Please go ahead. Good morning. Um, just a couple of follow-ups from some earlier questions. So I did hear your comments on free delivery and stimulus payments being some of the things that were obviously helping April be quite strong. But in terms of the impact that we could see moving forward from people beginning to get out and about more, driving more, going back to work in coming months, how do you think that dynamic with the consumer will play out on your business? Well, again, I, I think as uh, I think Andy asked a similar question, it is uh, hard to say, of course, but again, I go back to the research that we have done with our own guests as to why they chose Wingstop, and, you know, the things that stand out above and beyond, you know, there's nothing else open, for example, have everything to do with uh, convenience, accessibility, delivery, quality, craveability, like uh, those are the things that are driving the occasions into Wingstop more so than everybody else is closed. And so, you know, we're gonna we're gonna stand confident that uh, our brand is able to remain resilient even as the market opens back up. And I would say, you know, one other comment just to add to this, we we did note uh, that we ended the first quarter even before a lot of this uh, COVID impact at 9.9 percent .9 same store sales growth. So the brand was already performing at a very high level. 
Uh, that's helpful. And just one more that, again, you, you touched on, but just a little bit more granularity. So I, I completely understand that most of your traditional advertising options are completely off the table with virtually every sports league uh, on, on the planet shut down right now. Uh, nice pivot to, to delivery. That did very well for you guys over the last two months and some other things. But in terms of thinking about the balance of 2020, um, any high-level strategy in terms of staying in front of these customers uh, over the balance of the year without having to too heavily rely on, on the, the free delivery? Yeah, Jeff, um, I think, if anything, the strength and performance of the brand uh, during this time is perhaps the best indicator of something I know I've been trying to say for many, many years, but sadly we get positioned against other wing-oriented sports bars that don't that aren't relevant, but uh, Wingstop doesn't need the sports occasion in order to be strong. And I think there's no better testament to that than what's happening right now. Um, if you go back to our uh, Analyst Day presentation in January, we called out uh, very clearly that our approach strategically was to capture uh, a huge segment of the population that are heavy QSR users that are generally unaware or not users of Wingstop and convert them into our brand. If anything, I would say that strategy is sound and, and effective. Now, during this time frame, we did have some media positioned against sports, but the vast majority of our media uh, is pointed towards lifestyle occasions. And so this gave us a great opportunity to pivot even more dollars uh, as we could towards places like Twitch, Hulu, uh, and other places where people are consuming content right now. So. Again, just to reinforce, this is an example of the strength of this brand and not being one that has to be tied to sports occasions. Thank you. The next question comes from Nicole Miller with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about April same store sales in terms of what time of day the comps are coming at. So I'm curious if they're still coming at peak meal periods or essentially being spread out to different parts of the day. And to the extent they are at peak meal periods, then that is amazing throughput. And I too was thinking back to your January analyst day in the presentation where you have a very targeted approach to building your talent. So what are you learning about your teams right now? Thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you for the questions. Um, I do want to uh, talk about the talent, but first um, let me uh, address uh, the other question. I think that uh, from a day part perspective, uh, we have seen growth across all day parts um, fairly consistently. The only area where we saw less growth was in late night and only because uh, many of our brand partners wisely uh, close their restaurants earlier than normal. So our typical operating hours are 11 a.m. to 12 midnight. Many uh, have changed their hours during this time to a 10 p.m. closure, which has just taken away those last couple hours and reduced our growth. So I don't consider that indicative of anything other than that decision that they made wisely. Um, on the people side, I mentioned in my commentary, um, we've always believed we have a solid and strong culture here. and uh, Donnie Upshaw did a great job of presenting uh, what it is that makes this place so unique. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really proud of our team and how fast we reacted, how quickly we came together, how seamless the process was to immediately provide information to our brand partners in the field and prepare them for navigating this change. And without the strength of the culture we have here at Wingstop, uh, the transparency, the trust, the things that are necessary for any business to be highly successful, uh, I don't know that we would have been in the same position. So I think it has everything to do with the strength and success that we've seen during this time. Thank you. The next question comes from Michael Thomas with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Um, a quick question on the digital side of the business. You know, obviously you guys and 
a lot of other restaurants are seeing a huge surge in, in digital sales during this. So what are some of the key things you guys can do coming out of this as consumers start to have, like, other choices, other ways to order and get their food to, to keep consumers on the digital platform and to keep coming back to you guys through that platform? Good morning. Well, I think if you look back over our history, we've only been growing our digital platform and we've done it organically, uh, meaning we have not provided an incentive prior to our free delivery promotion. And with that, you know, we, we moved digital, our digital mix up to uh, 65% during uh, the month of April, which is squarely right in the position of large pizza chains as a competitor, right? And I think if you look at other brands, they certainly will be fortifying their digital efforts. Uh, for Wingstop, we've made substantial investments over the past few years to position ourselves this way. And so I think coming out of this, um, we'll take some of the learnings, uh, which really have more to do with how we can tweak, enhance, and make it better for the guest so that that experience is pretty seamless. But the good news is, you know, we walked into this situation with an app rating that was above four and a half stars typically, um, as well as our web uh, ordering platform. So our team has done an exceptional job of making it easy, which, again, I go back to the research we've done. Guests are com commenting on that now. It's very easy to order at Wingstop. Gotcha, thanks. And quick follow-up, I think you had mentioned that you have greater confidence in the international growth in this off-premise type of model. Just curious, you know, any thoughts on, on timing of that relative to what you were thinking at the analyst day and, and um, you know, if that opportunity has sort of been pushed out maybe a little bit with everything going on um, or, you know, just any general thoughts there. Thanks. Yeah, and you 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 uh, phrased it properly. We We are confident in modifying our approach to new markets and existing markets with our growth in international. Certainly, those markets out there today have been adversely affected by COVID-19 with the closure of a lot of dining rooms and or just mandatory closures in markets like uh, the UK and France. Those two markets, for example, have reopened, but only for digital uh, and delivery, you know, off-premise occasions. But they're, they're coming back nicely. So I think it just speaks to the strength um, of that approach. So we will see a delay. Uh, simply because we have to wait for those uh, markets to reopen, to move forward. Uh, but again, I think uh, uh, the strategy is sound in terms of where we'll go next. So slight delay, but uh, I'm, in, I'm excited to get back and uh, reopen those markets and start to grow aggressively. Great. Thank you. Best of luck. The next question comes from Chris O'Cole with CFL. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, Charlie, did the free delivery promotion generate a good return for the weeks it was available, or do you need to see continued follow-through from the guests that use the promotion to justify the return on that type of promotion? Yeah, it's a, a good question. It, I would say it did a great job of um, anchoring the business in delivery and building the business arguably faster than we would have expected under our uh, pre-COVID-19 strategy. Uh, so I would call that a fantastic return on investment. We certainly do need to see repeat. The beauty of it is most of that, or all of that business in the free delivery was through wingstop.com, which means we have complete access to who those customers are. We can engage our CRM platform to market directly to them and encourage them to come back. So time will tell, but it's certainly uh, squarely, uh, uh, how we're going to approach this uh, strategically. Great. And then I assume the National Marketing Fund is, is seeing more growth than you guys expected given the sales list. So I was wondering if you need to spend at the same rate as the contribution growth or if you can save some of the funds for more strategic periods. Um, we could do either or, quite frankly, um, and to be determined. But we're getting into the uh, um, the planning mode for the back half of the year as well as uh, 2021. So we'll be making those decisions uh, here pretty quick. But uh, it the possibility exists for both, but we haven't made a determination of what would change. Great. Thanks, guys. The next question comes from John Tyre with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. 
Great. Thanks. Just a few for me. Um, quick, I think you mentioned earlier in the call uh, p potentially providing some assistance to international franchisees. Can you just elaborate on that specifically and then just a couple after? Sure. Um, there are a number of ways we can support them. Uh, one is through uh, royalty deferrals, uh, which is very common in our industry to do, to just say, hey, you know what, when when you're ready, um, you know, and, and things reemerge, we can start to uh, receive royalties again. Um, that helps put cash in their pockets. The other is leveraging our supply chain uh, capabilities, providing access to um, food products as needed um, with a deferred payment schedule. Um, so those are two examples of things we can do to help uh, provide cash infusions uh, into our franchisees' hands. Okay. And then in, in the U.S., I believe at your investor day, you talked about uh, going forward the, the potential mix of new stores in kind of captive locations uh, stepping up, like sporting arenas or, or airports, et cetera. Does this crisis um, either alter that thinking or per, perhaps just delay those types of new store openings? Well, uh, you know, many of those types of venues, notably the sporting um, – uh, the, the sports stadiums, the casinos, malls, places like that have been closed down. So those, that's where we're experiencing actually restaurants that had to close because of this uh, temporarily. However, uh, it does reinforce our thinking around uh, dark kitchens or cloud kitchens, as they're called in some cases. And we've already been heading down that path, and we consider that a non-traditional location, but it certainly helps to uh, – confirm our, our thinking that uh, restaurants without seats uh, can be easily deployed in the Wingstop system and uh, with uh, great results. I mentioned earlier, but we already have one in the UK uh, that's doing well. We have some planned here in the US. So a little more uh, color on that will come uh, in future calls, but uh, we, are, we are excited about the opportunity of formats that have fewer seats. Great. And then just lastly for me, I, I know um, historically the company has paid a special dividend when leverage levels kind of hit in that four to five, just under 4% or four times range. And, you know, given the pace of growth of the business now, um, just curious to see how you're thinking about a potential special dividend um, given that, you know, balancing cash preservation against uh, the idea that your business is growing at such a rapid clip. Hey, John, this is this is Michael. Um, you know, I think as it relates to our leverage level, um, in light of the current situation, um, we don't have, you know, our traditional, I guess, as we signaled um, earlier in the year, that we would likely explore increasing our leverage the middle of this year. At this time, um, in light of the backdrop, um, I don't think that's something we currently have planned. Um, that being said, um, obviously we continue to pay a regular dividend as part of our overall return of capital strategy for our shareholders, and our board of directors did announce um, or declare a dividend uh, this morning, as you as you saw in our release. You know, that being said, um, we'll continue to monitor the situation, um, but at the, but at this time we don't have any immediate plans to increase our leverage. Great, thank you. Good luck. The next question comes from Andrew Selzik with CMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, and thanks for taking the question. Um, with the strong comp trends and the advertising pivots, have you had the opportunity to take a look at, you know, kind of broadly how brand awareness levels have changed? And within that, you know, maybe maybe can you give a little bit of color around what you're seeing in terms of fortress markets versus newer markets in terms of, you know, whether it's comps or digital penetration or any other metrics? Yeah, I think, uh, one, uh, it's only been a month, uh, maybe six weeks, eight weeks, and so hard to gauge where uh, awareness levels have modified during this time. We'll know more, and we tend to look at that at the end of uh, each quarter. And so uh, we can look at Q1, but that's really not relevant to uh, the COVID-19 experience. So more to come on that. As it relates to the differentiated markets of Fortress, non-Fortress, and so on in performance, I would only say that performance has been really consistent across all markets. There have only been one or two markets where uh, we've seen any sort of meaningful change, um, and we've addressed those 
by way of supporting the markets through some value offerings. Good example of that would be um, very far south Texas near border uh, communities, as well as Las Vegas, where they shut down the entire uh, uh, casino strip, right? So um, those are two extreme examples. Otherwise, it's been very consistent across all markets. Great. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Nick Setian with Webbush. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess, you know, the, the, the question I want to ask is, you know, in, in April, can you just maybe talk about the cadence uh, of, of the April comp? Uh, you know, did we start out sort of in the in maybe low teens the way we ended, uh, or, you know, or, or, or mid-teens and then accelerate? And then the second question is, um, you know, you guys have talked about a strategy to, to maybe, maybe mitigate the volatility around wind costs. Um, and, you know, where are we with that strategy and, and, and maybe just an update there? Yeah, so uh, to give you perspective on the comp acceleration, um, it did uh, accelerate through the month um, somewhat rateably week by week to give perspective coming out of uh, the first quarter. Uh, and then can you repeat your second question? I was looking at data on that now. Um, I'll jump in on the wing cost on the wing cost volatility. I mean, obviously that's something um, we're very familiar with, as well as our brand partners. Um, and as we've talked about before, you know, we've obviously built our model to be able to weather that type of volatility. And as you heard earlier um, on the call from Charlie, you know, our brand partners, um, you know, when when wing prices fell, you know, near the dollar per pound range. Our brand partners were seeing food costs, you know, roughly 30 percent, and so really enjoying strong four-wall margins. But at the same time, our our brand partners are aware of the, you know, that's a temporary, a temporary change, and so we've got um, we've got them, I guess, familiar with that type of volatility and how to continue to execute the business. Thank you. The next question comes from Brian Baccaro with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, and hope everyone is well and healthy. Um, just wanted to follow up on the pace of U.S. development this year, and could you provide a little more context on the impact of construction and permitting constraints you're currently seeing? Uh, were there any openings uh, in April, and, and maybe what a reasonable range of potential openings might be over the next couple of quarters? Thank you. Hey, Brian. Uh, I can give you as much as uh, possible, but essentially things have pretty much shut down. I will. I will say that and compliment uh, one of our uh, entrepreneurial team members who actually got a restaurant open in California by way of FaceTime video inspections, which I thought was genius. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to try and get restaurants open, but it's hard. Um, you know, some municipalities just aren't working or doing anything, and so it's very difficult to get them out to sites. Um, we opened three restaurants in the month of April. I was thrilled with that. Uh, two in the U.S., one international. And, uh, you know, as we see things start to reemerge, uh, markets reopening through the month of May, um, you know, maybe in June, uh, July, we start to see some restaurants come back online. But as you can imagine, there's going to be a glut of uh, uh, demand put upon a lot of these municipalities. And so it's hard to say how fast they will react but know that we will be out there uh, as aggressively as we can. And the only other thing is, as you know, the banks, um, you know, have really stopped a lot of development-oriented funding so that they can be out there helping support stimulus plans. Um, that is a small impact, but not, not a big one. Uh, we can offset that um, with our balance sheet strength, if need be, in areas where we feel like we want to accelerate rate growth, as I mentioned before. So. We're watching it every single day. We're going to move as aggressively as we can to get back. All right, that's helpful. Thanks, Charlie. The next question comes from Peter Saleh with CTIG. Please go ahead. Great, thanks, and uh, thanks for taking the question. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I just wanted to come back to the conversation around digital mix. I think you guys said in April, digital and delivery. You know, 65% of of the sales. I think that's you know 
three times almost what it was you know, two two years ago. Uh, what is your anticipation on how much of that digital mix you'll be able to hold on to once you know, kind of pull back a little bit on the more aggressive delivery offers? Um, and as we go forward, do you anticipate holding on to most of that? I mean, historically, have you seen consumers who switch to digital stick with it, or is there a little bit of a switch back and forth? No, I definitely uh, think there's a stickiness to switching to digital. It's easier for the guest. It's easier for the team in the restaurant. Um, and a lot of it is just training consumer behavior uh, in this regard. And, and again, I go back to the research we did where guests complimented the fact that it was so much easier to execute a digital transaction. It's hands off. Um, it's, it's simple. Um, for us, it comes with a higher check average, so it's a win-win. I would also remind us of our stated goal, which is to digitize every transaction in Wingstop. So um, my hope is that it sustains and grows. Um, I'd love to see it at 100%, and I think that's achievable uh, over, the long, over the long run. I just wanted to follow up. I know a couple quarters ago you guys were talking about the new kitchen equipment uh, process that would reduce, you know, cook times. Uh, given, but it sounded like you pulled back a little bit on on how aggressive you may have wanted to be with that, saying it's maybe unnecessary. Do you feel now that with the surge in sales, that are you revisiting uh, that process, or um, are you still of the same mind? Well, it, it I'll remind us of the positioning of that equipment. It has more to do with. Um, locations that would fall into non-traditional spaces or areas with very high footfall so that we can provide a faster transaction in terms of the individual transaction speed to our guests. But as it relates to whether or not that has an impact going forward for the traditional domestic business, um, you know, we, we have restaurants that are operating in the three and a half to four million dollar a year sales range with a very similar footprint to what our typical restaurant is. So we don't believe we have a capacity constraint, nor have we seen a capacity constraint with this strong comp growth. I think we're far from it. So we don't need that, that uh, cooking platform to help alleviate any strain in the business. However, it does create uh, a great opportunity for us to put restaurants in areas like, you know, uh, airports and other types of you know, high-density locations that we normally would not have done. That's really what it's positioned for. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. The next question comes from Jake Bartlett with SunTrust. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, you know, Michael, my, my first question is, is really on GNA. Uh, I know there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about the business um, with the COVID um, outbreak going on, but in terms of GNA, is there is there you know, a little more certainty there, kind of aside from the, the million dollar um, you know uh, charitable contribution you made? Should we kind of think of prior guidance as as um, as, as, as valid going forward? I think Jake. Um, I think there's still a fair amount of um, unpredictable components within GNA. Examples would be how quickly we hire and fill roles in this new environment, as well as how quickly we turn travel um, back on. And so without without clarity at this time, kind of into um, kind of how those components of GNA will play out, um, we're going to uh, continue to monitor it. And as we said earlier on the call, as soon as we have a little bit more clarity into that, we'll definitely make sure that we provide updates. Okay. And then, you know, the next question is just on restaurant-level margins and some of the moving pieces. I know the, the kind of the near-term um, increase in, in hourly pay um, and, and also the, the, the big surge in delivery. But any way you can help us um, maybe kind of frame what – you know, at a given level of comp, what, what, what margins would be or maybe help us um, in terms of, of what a percentage of comp is worth in terms of restaurant-level margins, um, you know, in the current structure? Yeah, Jake, I think, I think probably, you know, everything we know today, I would probably say 2018 is probably a good proxy for, uh, for restaurant margins. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
The next question comes from Matt DeFresco, Guggenheim. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations on a strong quarter. I'll keep this somewhat quick. It was just regarding delivery. Um, I know you've been saying 65% digital. Um, is that correct then to assume almost all of that is delivery, or can you sort of break that out on how much is uh, walking up and getting that um, digitally pre-ordering? Yeah, I uh, appreciate the question. And uh, the answer is roughly 30% during the month of April of, uh, of our sales was delivery, so the rest was uh, carryout. Excellent. And then I guess just last question, with respect to that digital and the delivery component, um, obviously you're, you've said you're going to look at maybe stores with less seating, almost no seating, um, in a couple of U.S. openings as well. I think that's obviously something from COVID you're learning from here that you're succeeding very well at that. Um, is there also then the – are you seeing a growing number of franchisees um, looking to do their own delivery and um, – maybe to improve on speed, time, or even lower some of the costs associated with delivery or the fees related to uh, DoorDash? Uh, yes, to the answer of franchisees and our focus on restaurants with fewer seats, driving more off-premise mix, I think is going to be uh, something we will explore uh, into the future here. Um, but as it relates to delivery on our own, uh, no discussion on that. Very happy with our partnership with DoorDash. Um, thrilled with their execution, especially if you think about how much their business had to adjust and, and execute uh, during this tough time. I think they did a fantastic job for our business. Um, there's always opportunity uh, to get better on all fronts, but I was really pleased um, with our partnership there uh, and a great investment we made uh, in committing to that uh, a while back. As it uh, relates to um, where we go from here on that, I think that, uh, you know, you will continue to focus on building and deepening that relationship to improve our service times. Our margins already, uh, as it relates to digital, are quite strong, or delivery, uh, quite strong compared to anybody else. And a lot of that's driven by the high check average that I mentioned before that Wingstop enjoys. But also, uh, we've done a lot of work internally and in partnership with DoorDash to minimize the amount of wait time in the restaurant and um, also minimize, therefore, the delivery time with our guests. We, have, we share a lot of information. We monitor it every single day. And uh, I think we can only get better um, with uh, our approach here. So I don't see a need for us to have to do it on our own. Do you mind, since you brought it up, just sharing that wait time? Um, I know we hear from the pizza guys sometimes that number is always around 30 minutes or 20 minutes is their goal. Um, what is your wait time right now for a round trip on a DoorDash delivery order? Yeah, let me let me break down my comment a little bit. So one one of the elements of wait time is uh, how long the DoorDash driver, what they call their dashers, has to wait in a Wingstop restaurant to get their order and leave. And we try to get that down to almost none, um, but we try to keep it under two minutes as best we can. Then once they get to the to the uh, consumer, we try to make that uh, timing somewhere around 14 to 15 to 20 minutes tops uh, because we restrict the trade area. So all in, we target somewhere around 35 minutes, which has been pretty consistent on average. Excellent. Thank you so much. The next question comes from James Sanderson with North Coast Research. Please go ahead. Hey guys, uh, congratulations on a great uh, start to quarter two. I just wanted to get a little bit more feedback on the international segment. I think you mentioned that sales volumes were down about 50% if I understood correctly and that uh, 27 stores were still closed. Just wanted to do, if you could help us understand how that trend has flowed over the past four to six weeks and whether you anticipate any type of drag on operating cash flow from any type of uh, royalty relief for your international partners. Good morning. Um, thank you for the question. The answer is we're not quite sure how, how long some of those uh, uh, stores will remain closed. Uh, we hope that they will reopen. And during the month of April, we did see uh, improvement across the international platform uh, in a number of markets, some of which associated with complete closures like in uh, London as well as in France that have reopened with off-premise only uh, occasions, and, and they're, they're emerging from that, so we're, we're pleased with that. 
but we don't really have good visibility into markets like Mexico and Indonesia, our two biggest markets, mm -hmm. as to when reopening will occur. The one thing we're happy about is that they have invested previously in delivery uh, and off-premise um, by way of uh, digital transactions that's helping their business, but certainly they rely on the dining room. So more to come on that. As it relates to the cash uh, drag, don't expect that to be um, uh, material uh, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still a smaller part of our business, but uh, at the same time, we're going to do what is right and necessary to take care of our uh, international brand partners so that they can emerge strong and ready to grow. Hey, Charlie, can I ask just one quick follow-up question? That would be, uh, you've got an, a great example of a ghost kitchen in the UK. Any feedback on how that uh, business has performed over the past four to six weeks as well? Again, uh, it had to close like everything else, okay. uh, yeah, but you. it has reemerged and uh, is building back its volume. But again, it was it was doing very well prior to COVID-19, so we're, we're really encouraged by what the potential is there. Thank you. Take care. This concludes our question and answer session and also concludes the conference. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.